Okay. All right, guys, we can go ahead and get started today. We have a very special lecture in store for you guys, uh, presented by our very own Dr. Herschler, who many of you guys already know is one of our clinical professors of psychiatry here at WVU specializing in both addiction psychiatry as well as pain. Dr. Herschler is uh, our primary psychiatrist over at the WVU Pain Clinic, in addition to dividing his clinical time and responsibilities, uh, leading multiple co-clinic groups over at the Lakewood Center, in addition to treating patients at the Center for Hope and Healing, uh, as well as teaching both residents and faculty here at Chestnut Ridge. Before relocating to West Virginia, Dr. Hersher served as the medical director of inpatient psychiatric <laughs> services over at the uh, VA healthcare system in Baltimore, where he also served as the director of the methadone maintenance program. In addition to that, previously he served as a clinical staff attending over at the Thomas Finan State Psychiatric Hospital of Maryland. Dr. Hirsch obtained his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Oder Vine University out in Westerville, Ohio, uh, before going on to obtain his MD degree from the Medical College of Toledo, and later completing his psychiatric residency, as well as his addiction fellowship over at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. When he was a resident, uh, he was awarded the Russell Monroe Prize for the top resident research project, and his work and his uh, career has ultimately culminated in multiple nationwide presentations at summits hosted by the American Psychiatric Institution, uh, as well as the American Association for Directors of Psychiatric Residency Training. Dr. Hersher has also presented at multiple research symposiums hosted and organized by the VA healthcare system in Maryland. I've had the personal opportunity to work with him since his first week here at Chestnut Ridge, which would have been back in 2017. And I can honestly say he's been a wonderful teacher, he's been a wonderful mentor, and he's been a wonderful friend. We're still trying to convince him to play piano for us at this year's graduation, but uh, we got a couple months to work on that. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Dr. Hersher a warm welcome. I want to talk about positive psychology and positive psychiatry. And uh, this is just an introduction to this field because it's really a very large field. I'm just going to try to give you a lay of the land or understand some of the basics of it. And then we'll get into a bit of the complexity. So I have no conflict of interest to disclose related to this talk. I want to start, start out by talking about fossilization. What I mean by fossilization is that people can get kind of a fixed viewpoint about things. We get so ingrained in our ways of thinking. I think you have to challenge that in medicine and all fields of, of study. You, know, you have to be careful about getting too ingrained in your way of thinking and open up your mind into other perspectives. So don't get fi fixed into a worldview of a certain way. And then also I want to talk about purpose. So uh, Clay Marsh always talks about purpose and how important that is and how it drives us. But there's something called the retrospective purpose and the prospective. And our retrospective purpose is kind of how things have been, our reason for being that's been present for a while. And a prospective purpose is kind of getting a new uh, purpose that reshapes our way of thinking. And so I'm offering a prospective purpose here. And so typically we kind of think of mental health care as a system that focuses on symptoms of illness, the reduction relapse prevention. But I, I'm going to offer an additional development of positive target attributes. Well-being and flourishing is important to mental health, and I'll explain why. So Henry Kissinger, who was the Secretary of State under uh, Nixon, once said, if you don't know where you're headed, any road will take you there. And if you're just trying to eliminate symptoms, that's not much of a view of the future. So I'm going to suggest that it helps to have kind of a clear idea of where you're headed. So how do you know what patients want? Well, when patients come to us, are they asking to not be depressed or not be anxious? And I think that you can actually figure out what patients want by thinking about New Year's resolutions. So what do people make New Year's resolutions about? And 
basically three categories of things that people make leaders resolutions about. One is health, but also love and finances are important to patients. That's kind of true of most people. That those are the, the key elements of a flourishing life. And if you look back at what Freud said, Freud was asked what is mental health, and he said it was to love and to work. And so are those the kind of key elements of success in life, you know, to flourish, you know, love and work, to have deep and delightful love, and to have a great reputation among knowledgeable people at your work? So maybe that's where the, what the view of the future should be. So here's an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start out talking about challenges and opportunities in psychiatry and psychology. Then I'm going to discuss nine stories related to positive psychology and positive psychiatry. These are all different perspectives on the field. So you have the biological perspective, the psychological perspective, the social perspective, the spiritual perspective, the environmental perspective, the technological perspective, life experience and life story perspective, and then putting wellness into practice is kind of the end of the perspectives. And then we're going to translate all these different perspectives into bridging the gap uh, between psychiatry and wellness mm -hmm. overall. So th these challenges come from Joshua Gordon, who is the director of NIMH, and uh, he's given some talks on the kind of the state of psychiatry and what N NIMH is trying to do to improve the field. And uh, these challenges are important. So first of all, one in five adults will be suffering at any moment in the United States from a diagnosable mental illness, according to the DSM. And it's slightly higher in women, and it goes across all the ethnicities. And mental illness typically affects the young, so adolescence and young adulthood, that's when mental illness takes place. And these are chronic illnesses, largely, that persist throughout the course of someone's life. So there's a lot of burden psychologically and, and as far as work productivity and, and uh, the, the financial aspects of it. And our diagnostic system tells us nothing about what goes wrong with people or factors that contribute to illness. And the rule for patients is usually three diagnoses, not one. And so is this uh, three separate things wrong with the brain that's going on? Or is it one thing that's expressed in three different ways? And also we have a lack of biomarkers and objective measures for illness that can guide treatment and inform, inform us about the course of illness. And also the treatments don't work so well and they don't last. So for the last part, this is what I mean. You guys know the STAR-V study of antidepressant effectiveness uh, done by NIMH. So even after four steps in that study, 30% of patients don't respond. And a large percentage of patients who do respond relapse or do worse over time. And so there's, there's a lot of room for improvement in medications for psychiatric disorders. This is just an example. And then if you look at, this is Dr. Berry's slide. Uh, you know, that uh, if you look at relapse for drug addiction, 40 to 60% of patients with drug addiction relapse. And that's like other chronic illnesses, but still it's a, it's a big concern that our treatments just are not that effective for the illnesses that we're treating. So what are our opportunities? Well, where do we intervene? And we can intervene on multiple levels, from gene to cell to circuit, system factors, and then cognition, emotion, and behavior. And so I'm going to talk about how positive psychology and positive psychiatry impact us at the level of cognition and, and emotion and behavior, but translate to impacting at multiple levels of, the, of this uh, ways to intervene. So in 1998, Martin Seligman was elected as the president of the American Psychological Association. And his agenda was to not just look at problems that people have in psychology, and ameliorating symptoms and correcting illnesses, but kind of look at the other side. Though he calls it, that's a half-baked psychology, he says, and that uh, a full-baked psychology is when you look at both flourishing or positive mental health and not just illnesses and ameliorating them. So we're gonna hear from Martin Seligman. Let me see if I can get this uh, video going. <laughs> So on uh, Martin Seligman's heels, in 2012, Dilip Jesty became the president of the American Psychiatric Association. And he said, you know, psychiatry needs to think about this in the same sort of way that psychiatry needs to aim higher. And so he said the goal will not be just to improve psychopathology, but to help patients grow 
flourish, develop, and be more satisfied with their lives. And he was kind of focused on psychosocial factors in, uh, influencing that. There's really a lot to it. So I'm going to start out with the biology, the biological perspective, and talk about epigenetics. And so I'm sure you've heard of epigenetics before, but uh, so we can influence the way genes are expressed. And if you take identical twins, uh, they can be raised in the same family and have very different outcomes. One can be obese, and the other can be thin and fit. Or one could uh, have schizophrenia, and the other not. Or one could die young, and the other die much later in life. And so there's variable expression of the same genes, or a lack of complete penetrance of genes, so the penetrance is variable. So we can turn on and off promoters that uh, are involved in transcribing a gene. And that can happen by one gene influencing another gene or lifestyle and, and the environment and things in our lives influencing the way genes are expressed. And then also genetically, we can look at the DNA, you know, sequence the DNA of the healthiest, longest lived people kind of as a reference for you know, what, what is the genetics going on with these people and what happens. Uh, epigenetically to produce the, the greatest, the most successful phenotypes. And then also some people may be kind of sensitive or vulnerable genetically. So some people are kind of like orchids, which require a, a lot of care in raising, where other people are like dandelions and they thrive in any environment. And so genetics are influenced by things in our environment. So there's something called a neurobiological signature. And uh, well-being has a neurobiological signature, and that involves the neural rhythms and biotypes and biological algorithms. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And so first I'm going to talk about executive function and self-control. So our prefrontal cortex is involved in executive function. That's where decision-making and planning and problem-solving takes place. But actually the medial prefrontal cortex is where confidence is had. And uh, confidence and belief in the dorsal, in the, I'm sorry, in the uh, singular, anterior cingulate cortex can influence the stress response in the dorsal raphane nucleus where helplessness is, and the amygdala where anxiety and depression and negative emotion are housed. And so uh, we can downregulate the activity of the amygdala through the prefrontal cortex. And then also, priming is important. So Einstein talked about combinatory play where if he had a difficult mathematical problem, he would get out his violin and practice the violin and develop a different kind of neurological strength. And that would translate to priming his problem solving in mathematics. And so by developing one area of the brain, it kind of facilitates development in other areas. And of course, you've heard of homeostasis. You might not have heard of allostasis. Homeostasis is kind of uh, the stability and balance of the this, of living systems. And so that's part of well-being, but allostasis is stability through change. And so we have to respond to our environments and adapt and change and have stability through that. And that's a neurobiological process. And then neuroadaptation is a very important component of what happens in the brain. And so you can think about how medications affect the brain, you know, that the response is not immediate for most medicines that we use in psychiatry. And so the brain is adapting to the presence of the medicine, but we also adapt to the environment that we're in or to other environmental factors that are going on in our lives or lifestyle choices or even the way that we think that uh, we adapt to what's happening in our lives and that process is called neuroadaptation and then cognition uh, kind of follows through association so if you think about the beads of a pearl necklace you know associations in the mind travel from one association to the next that's the way we think and that's another neurobiological process. So there's really a neurobiology to well-being. I have this picture of a man walking through a field of grass because circuitry in the brain kind of works this way. If you walk through a field of grass, it's waist high, you knock down the grass. But if you take that path over and over and over again, eventually it becomes a dirt path and it's easy to follow. And so if somebody has depression for a couple weeks, they've knocked down the grass. But if someone has depression for years, it becomes a dirt path kind of thing in the brain where it's a very ingrained pathway and it's easy for the brain to fall into that pathway. So that's why we think about using medications long-term in people who have had long-term illness. But this is also important in well-being. So if we get good at what we practice, if you're practicing well-being, that gets more ingrained. And so 
the circuitry uh, is uh, becomes developed in what you practice health-wise or illness-wise. And there's something called competitive neuroplasticity. So you've probably heard of neuroplasticity about the way the brain can change uh, and, and grow by different influences. So the, the concept of competitive neuroplasticity is that there's only so much cortical real estate in the brain. And so if the brain is focused on practicing healthy behaviors, it kind of competes out the pathological stuff that's going on in the brain just by a use it or lose it kind of process of neuroplasticity. And so uh, the idea is that if you're practicing healthy functioning, then the other pathological stuff kind of diminishes out of disuse. So I've got a picture of pickles here because sometimes things that happen in the brain are irreversible. Like if somebody has schizophrenia, that's an irreversible neuro, neurobiological process that occurs in the brain probably. We think it's like a disease sort of process. And so that's like a cucumber becoming a pickle. You can't turn a pickle back into a cucumber. So someone can become the healthiest pickle they can be. And so that's, that's my point. <laughs> So also, we influence biology through nutrition and through uh, exercise. And so there's a new field of medicine called culinary medicine, which is about the marriage of flavor and health. And uh, you know, people can enjoy the, the, the pleasure of nourishment in what they taste. And uh, we know that physical activity can enhance mood and improve cognitive function. Uh, it improves self-esteem and uh, feelings of self-efficacy and it relieves symptoms of depression, anxiety, and it makes people more resilient to stress. So all this is the biology of well-being. And then we even have drugs which can promote well-being. So I call these salutaceutical drugs, and we have drugs that improve longevity, metformin, uh, which we of course know in, the, in treating diabetes, but that may prevent weight, weight gain, heart disease, and cancer. There's a newer drug called rapamycin, which is a product of a bacteria that prolongs life at multiple levels of organisms from yeast to mammals. And so that may be the way of the future to prolong life through a, a drug. Then we have nootropic drugs, which enhance cognition. And so caffeine is our best example of a nootropic drug that most people make use of. And so this may be the way of the future in positive psychiatry is to not just be treating illnesses, but promoting well-being and nootropic and living longer uh, through, through positive salutaceutical uh, uh, drugs. And then I also ask, you know, is Chantix a salutaceutical drug? And we know that binding to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor enhances cognition. And uh, Chantix is not particularly addictive because it's a partial agonist uh, at that receptor. So it, it may offer uh, kind of a nootropic effect. I don't know if we'll pursue that or not. So now I'm going to talk about the psychological perspective. Uh, so first of all, advancing your identity advances your health. And so uh, actually Eric Rankin has uh, done some writing about uh, identity and, and health. And uh, the, the key is to not settle for a stunted identity. You know, when you and you can empower your views about personal lovability and self-worth, it enhances health. And what can even happen is if someone's identity improves, it's like the, the illness existed in the old personality and uh, they kind of transitioned to a healthier way of viewing themselves. And then we have some uh, tools and evidence-based strategies. And there's lots of things in positive psychology and positive psychiatry, and I just touched on some of them. You heard Martin Seligman talk about optimism and its benefits in depression. Uh, I like to differentiate between conditional optimism and complacent optimism. Some people say that optimism is fantasy and it's not a healthy way to, to approach life and that a depressive realism is more kind of sensible. But the complacent optimism is like a child the night before Christmas. So they expect something positive to happen, but there's no effort involved. It's, it's just going to happen. And I'm interested in conditional optimism, which is like children getting together and getting some wood and some nails and some hammers, and they build a fort. And so there's effort involved that makes them optimistic. You know, that, uh, there's, a, there's a sensible reason why they're optimistic. And then post-traumatic growth is a concept out of positive psychology. 
which says that trauma is never good, but good things can happen as a result of trauma. And so one thing that can happen is people can feel vulnerable yet stronger. Uh, someone may be able to look back at a terrible experience, a traumatic experience, and say, you know, if I could survive that, I could survive almost anything. And then when new things come up that are difficult, they're like, oh, that's not so bad, I can do so much. And so if they can find a silver lining in a negative experience, like a tra traumatic experience, it kind of takes <coughs> the power out of the trauma a little bit and, and changes their viewpoint. And so I call that rescripting re the life story. And uh, so uh, another way of looking at this is like stress inoculation. So some people say, oh, stress is terrible. It destroys people's health. It's awful. But I look at stress as like a flu shot. When you get a flu shot, they inject the virus into you, your body fights it off, and then when you're exposed to the, to the flu, you're resilient to it because you've already been exposed. And so stress inoculation kind of says the same sort of thing. You know, that stress is difficult and miserable and you hate it, but you get through it, and then when something new comes up, yeah, it's not so bad because you, you've already been kind of toughened by stress. You could kind of liken that with um, uh, military training, Sports training. Yeah, so boot camp in the military is a perfect example of that. So they, they really are, have a grueling kind of, a, of experience in boot camp. And then when they go to combat, they're like, ah, I, you know, this isn't so bad. I moved to boot camp. Right, exactly. All right, so gratitude is a, a, I'm sure people have heard about the value of gratitude. It decreases depression and anxiety, uh, and it, it decreases body dissatisfaction, improves sleep. Uh, and uh, so there's lots of techniques that are used to improve gratitude. People can, uh, at the end of the day, list three good things that happened each day as a, like an intervention to improve gratitude. Uh, and being grateful about it, even just the, the chance to live can be helpful for people. And then dealing positively with negative people. So a lot of times people deal with negativity by getting engulfed in negativity and fighting with them. And it's an endless battle. What I recommend is absorbing the negativity and deflecting it. And that, that's kind of the positive approach to negativity. You can even look at someone who's kind of a negative influence as like a teacher to you. You know, that, that's somebody who's teaching you how to respond to negativity in a more positive way. And then you can have positive views of failure. So people say fear of failure and failure is such a scary, terrible thing. But you can also look at failure as a rehearsal for success. And so failure is kind of your road to success. And so you have to welcome failure in your life. You know, like it's just a rehearsal. And then Carol Dweck talks about the growth mindset. She says that if you teach a kid that they're successful because they're smart, when they come across a challenging problem, if they're not smart enough, they'll give up. But if you teach a kid that they're successful because they worked hard, then they come across a challenging experience in life, and they work harder and harder and harder at it because they know that's what makes them successful. And along those lines, Angela Duckworth talks about grit. And grit is, grit is that passion and perseverance and persistence that really makes people successful. And there's lots of ways to develop grit. You can have role models of grit, uh, parents or examples in, in your career, uh, even movies of people that are portrayed as gritty people or literature of gritty people. And so grit is a very positive thing in outcomes in life. And then Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi Mihai talks about flow. And flow is kind of the concept where you, you have a well-practiced behavior that becomes like effortless and beautiful and faultless because you practice it well enough. There has to be a balance between the challenge of the activity and, and how much you experience you have at it. And uh, if you think, if you know about sports, they talk about the zone. Or somebody like Michael Jordan who's making those beautiful shots at the end of the game, uh, where they're just in a, in a natural kind of automatic state. And the key to this is that you don't want to have an active mind when you're doing something automatic. And so it's quieting the mind that allows you to access that flow state. And then the last thing I'm talking about in this uh, these evidence-based strategies and tools is uh, that stress plus rest equals growth. And so uh, Stress recovery is how you recover from stress. And so it's so important to put your feet up and relax in between stressful times. So it's when we have chronic stress and no breaks from stress that we get in trouble. And the 
you have to take breaks from stress. And, and stress recovery is really the new fitness. And so like in sports, they use uh, sensory deprivation tanks and there's all kinds of technology about how to, people, how to help people recover from stress. It's a, it's a really interesting field. Also, you can look at the unconscious. I know we typically think of unconscious in psychiatry as people having unconscious conflict uh, or a core relationship, a core conflictual relationship that produces symptoms. But you can also have a, a well-organized unconscious that produces thriving. And so what is, the, what is the message that the thriving is trying to represent? Or what beautiful thing is your mind trying to learn represented by metaphor with the body? So you can have thriving schemas, like I've got something to prove, or I'll thrive in spite of them, or living a good life is the best revenge, or I hope God will leave me, or you bring out my best. And then you can have binds that impel people to thrive, like pleasing mother or father, uh, or another important figure in your life, or the desire to rededicate yourself to your, to your dreams to honor someone who has died by living a life worthy of their memory. And sibling rivalry and fears of failure, even a desire to attract a mate. So all those are unconscious processes that induce thriving that we don't tend to explore with patients, but are so valuable. And then I'm going to talk about uh, dealing with stress. So you have to be able to manage distress to thrive. Uh, you want to be able to breathe through stress or thrive on the stress. That's kind of the ultimate place to be. And recover well from stress and move from victimization to empowerment. And there's three things that help people with this. You've got coping skills, resilience, and mental toughness. And so coping skills, we think of the mature defense mechanisms like sublimation, altruism, and self-assertion, and uh, uh, affiliation. Uh, but also things like relaxation <coughs> techniques and compartmentalization. And uh, there's so many different coping skills that people can have. Meditation can be helpful. And then resilience is kind of, if you think about a bamboo plant, you know, bamboo, when there's a storm, the wind knocks it over, and it goes all the way to the ground, and then when the storm is over, it bounces back up the vertical. And so that's what resilience is about, is bouncing back from stress and, and difficulties. And so that's important in thriving on stress. And then sports psychology and uh, the military are interested in mental toughness. But I think it relates to our psychiatric patients you know, that we can help people become mentally tougher. And that happens, first of all, through visualization, that when you visualize success, that makes you tougher. And also, your self-talk. So you want to kind of feed the courage wolf and starve the fear wolf. And so uh, you, you want to kind of support positive uh, self-talk and back it up in ways that are sensible so that you believe what you're telling yourself and refute negative ideas that uh, are destructive. And so that's all about mental toughness. And then in sports, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, in positive psychology, we hear about happiness. You know, that's kind of what people associate with positive psychology. And uh, so Sonia Lubomirsky has probably written the most about happiness. And she says that happiness is the experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being, combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. And you have to remember that some people experience happiness, but it's kind of you know, it's, it's denial that prevents recognition of, of the problems associated with what's going on, like in bipolar mania or being high on drugs, or in the excitement of risk taking, like promiscuity or binge eating or overspending. And uh, also we know that happiness is largely influenced by biology and genetics and temperament. But uh, our attitude uh, strongly influences our happiness set. So this is from Sonia Lubomirsky's book on the how of happiness uh, from 2007. She has 12 uh, different evidence-based approaches to improving happiness. You can express gratitude, cultivate optimism, avoid overthinking in social comparison, practice acts of kindness, nurture relationships, develop strategies for coping, learn to forgive, increase flow experiences, savor life's joys, committing to your goals, practicing religion and spirituality, and taking care of your body. But there's a lot of other people that have written about happiness. Martin Seligman, who we heard from earlier, says that using your strengths makes you happy. And Peterson and Park say there's five strengths in particular that make people happy. And that's love, gratitude, hope, curiosity, and zest. 
And then Tony Robbins, who's the well-known uh, life coach, he, he's a kind of a famous life coach who coached Bill Clinton and Andre Agassi and all kinds of important people in society. He says that progress makes people happy and it's who you become that matters. Uh, and Sean Akers says that uh, what you, uh, doing something meaningful is what makes people happy and uh, how you contribute to, to the world at the, what you, the pleasure derived from bringing something to the world. And also happiness improves with social trust. So if you have an unsafe environment that can have a deleterious effect on happiness. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some people with mental illness uh, known to the world. Uh, so th there's no uh, HIPAA violations for these famous people. Uh, you know who this is? Right, that's Louis von Beethoven. So do you know what illness he had? They thought he had bipolar disorder. So he, he got very aggressive, had terrible mood swings. Even his Eroica symphony has manic excitement in the music. And uh, they, he couldn't negotiate a relationship with somebody over his lifetime, you know, like a meaningful relationship. And they thought he had bipolar disorder. And yet he wrote beautiful music and thrived in his life despite the serious illness untreated. And who's this? Dr. Nash. Yes, John Nash. <laughs> John Nash has schizophrenia. I think he's deceased now. Yeah. Um, but uh, he got a Nobel Prize for a game theory that he had. Uh, so he thrived despite having a serious mental illness. And who's this? <clears throat> Maeve, right? So Abe used to weep in public. He was so terribly depressed. And yet he's probably one of the most important presidents that uh, we've ever had in the United States. And Oprah, do you know what kind of trouble she had? So she had cocaine use disorder, and uh, she also had terrible trauma in her life. And, and yes, yeah, she's a billionaire, a very successful person. And then who's this? Yeah, yeah so Barb, do you know what illness she had? She had social phobia. She was terribly afraid to sing in public, and yet she had a beautiful career as a singer and a wonderful actress. So she thrived despite having uh, social phobia. So sometimes when I'm working with patients and they feel demoralized by having an illness and they're not very optimistic, I might bring up some, there's lots of examples like this of people who had serious illnesses and yet were able to find a way to adapt and, and function pretty well in their lives. So how about the social perspective? Have you guys heard of the Harvard Adult <laughs> Development Study? That was a study that was done at Harvard. There's been several directors of the study because it started with guys in college. Uh, there was all men in the study and actually uh, John F. Kennedy was a, a member of the uh, subject in the study. And they followed them from college years all the way until they were in their 80s. And they wanted to see what predicts uh, success in life and good health and functioning well. And uh, so, uh, George Valland uh, said, well, it's defense mechanisms, look for defense mechanisms that are making a difference. He's written a book called Adaptation to Life about that. But the latest director says, you know, it's even more kind of simple than that. You know, the key is to have somebody that you can count on in your life. And that relationships are the key to well-being, success, flourishing in life. That's the most important thing. So you want to surround yourself with people that wish you well, for people like older people who don't have social contacts, they, their friends have died off or their spouse is gone, or, or even people in day-to-day -day life, you know, pet companionship can be a wonderful source of social support. And then there's something called social intelligence, which is kind of how you navigate through social relationships. And uh, ideally you want to glide well socially in relationships and uh, navigate through tension. Uh, of course, at the heart of relationship is conversation. There's something called constructive responding in positive psychology, where somebody said, yeah, has a success, you don't say, oh, that's nice, or you know, congratulations. You say, you know, when did you hear about it, and what was going on, and you know, what, what, what were you doing that made that so possible for you? And, and so kind of constructively exploring their success, uh, that, that make that improve relationships and respond that way. It's fascinating to me that, <clears throat> that um, autistic people don't know how to do that, but you can train them to do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Actually, in the, so the comprehensive soldier fitness, which is something other psychology is involved, trying to prevent PTSD for the military, they work on constructive responding as a way to, to help support their strengths and reduce the likelihood of PTSD, among a lot of other techniques. Um, so intimacy, how do you tell if someone has good intimacy? Well, it's the depth of the relationship and the strength of those involved. So uh, I'm blanking on who the famous uh, what was the guy who came up with that. And there's a direct link between achievement in work, career, and language. So there's a book called uh, Bridges Out of Poverty, which it looks at how do people climb out of an impoverished situation. And language is so important to that. So if someone can acquire the language of the socioeconomic strata, strata above them, they integrate into that society, they get a job in that society. And so language is like a key kind of developmental aspect to socioeconomic. And then uh, resilience to stress has been shown to, to, to be correlated with social competence, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, social skills. And effective parenting, there's a lot to effective parenting, and there's something called parenting styles that you may have heard of that before. Probably the most important thing is just to be likable. Now, children learn from parents that they like. And if you enter their space positively and believe in your children, you know, they'll kind of thrive in the tailwind of, the, of you believing in them. And then, you, of course, you want to have the right heroes uh, in developing and thriving uh, as far as social influences. You know, if you, if you kind of uh, if you idealize people who have kind of negative life, uh, the, the life styles, then that can be a, have a negative impact on someone. And then posture is destiny is something that's said in yoga, but it is very important in social health. And uh, they did an interesting study where they looked at depressed patients and they Botox their frown lines. And those patients were no longer depressed because they couldn't frown. So their body language changed. But also those people who had their Botox, Botox frown lines couldn't empathize because they couldn't mirror the facial expressions of people who were unhappy. So your body language influences how you feel. And so if you take on a confident posture, you have an air of confidence about you, that impels you to act more confidently and do things to make yourself be more confident. And so you want to kind of think about what is my body language? You know, what am I expressing with that and how does that influence me? And then the, the relationship that you have with the patients is so important. Uh, I love this painting. It's a famous painting of the doctor-patient relationship. So what are the components of the, the, of the therapeutic relationship? Well, first of all, there was a group of psychologists who looked at, the, at the, the relationship. And what they said is there's like 800 different kinds of psychotherapy. And how can there be so many different kinds of psychotherapy that have some positive influence on the outcomes of patients? There must be common elements between these therapies. And so what they found is there are four common elements. You've got the relationship, expectancy and a hope, uh, the technique that's involved, and also client factors. And so the relationship is a core feature of what makes psychotherapy work. And so a lot of this is beyond spoken words. And John Allen says it's just the way people relate to each other. You know, it's the psychological understanding that develops between them. And so really what it's about is a compassionate solidarity, you know, that I'm in this with you, I'm behind you. And you have to engage with patients. They have to trust and believe in you. And there's even an element of surrender, you know, that they <coughs> surrender to accepting the help that they're receiving. And I trust that clinician with my life. And you can also have a healing presence about you. So like empowering a calm, empowering presence can help to impel the patient to feel comforted and, and encouraged. And so even presence can have an effect on healing. And then Carl Menninger said that love cures people, both those who give it to those who receive it. And so I'm talking about a professional kind of love, you know, not the inappropriate romance with a patient, but the, you know, to be in, to loving in a professional way that, that has a healing aspect to it. And uh, I talk to people about having kind of firmness so there's always a balance between kindness and firmness. And uh, you, know, you want to, like an older, an older female patient who's depressed, but that might be more kind. And then an aggressive sociopathic patient, you might want to be more firm. 
And then, uh, you know, of course, you want to instill hope through credibility with patients so that you can be believable. William Osler talked about uh, imperturbability. And so he says that you want to have a coolness and presence of mind under all circumstances, calmness amid storm, clearance of judgment in moments of great peril. And it's that I've got this attitude about working with a patient. And that's, that's gained incrementally. So through experience, you get more confident and more imperturbable in working with patients. <coughs> and so you want them to feel that they're in good hands, that the patient can be confident and feel deeply cared for by their doctor. And that's where the magic lies. The spiritual approaches, I'm running out of time here. Uh, hope is so important. When people are hopeless, I say, you know, how certain can you be that it's hopeless? There has to be some room for doubt. And so you can lend hope to a patient. You know, a patient who's hopeless, you can lend your stubborn hope to the patient. They can borrow your hope. And hope is, of course, associated with well-being. And if you think of the placebo effect, it's like expectancy and hope <coughs> that makes a placebo work. And then inner peace is a nice spiritual aspect of thriving. Muhammad said patience is the key to contentment. And it's, a, it's just a way of living and being. And it's not peace in the absence of tension and turmoil, but peace despite tension and turmoil. And Eckhart Tolle said that you have to be friendly with the present moment to have inner peace. You kind of find your inner sanctuary. So the goal is to kind of be comfortable in the role, your body open and loose and relaxed comfortably. <coughs> And then wonder and awe, uh, Einstein talked about an oceanic feeling that he would get uh, when he had wonder and awe. And uh, he says, we have to admire with humility the beautiful harmony and structure of this world as far as we can grasp it. But you must move from wonder to wisdom and from awe to action. And so what do we do with this feeling of the grand mystery of living? And then I'm interested in the triumph of the spirit. So if you think of Stephen Hawking, who had Lou Gehrig's disease and talked with a cheek muscle, that was the only way he could communicate. Uh, you know, he said that don't be disabled in spirit as well as physically. So that's kind of the attitude of a triumph of the spirit. And then probably the most beautiful uh, aspect of spiritual well-being, in my opinion, comes from Abraham Burgess's book, Cutting for Stone. It's a novel, a medical novel. And he says, make something beautiful of your life. And so he actually, in another talk, talks about a doctor at the end of his life who he shares a glass of champagne with before his last breath, you know, to celebrate the beauty of his life. It would be nice to be able to do that day with that doctor, have some champagne to celebrate. So also the, the brain adapts to the environment, and that's an important aspect of thriving. And so you look at Denmark, which the Gallup poll says is where the happiest people live. So what is the environment like there that makes people so happy? So they have a concept called Huga, which is like a belongingness and, and uh, warmth and, and uh, comforting feeling that they're interested in and uh, the kind of a well-being. And they, they like to sit by fires. There's a lot of cold in Denmark, uh, yet they sit by a fire by candlelight and they, they, enjoy, they enjoy that warmth. And also the happiest places tend to be the most beautiful uh, if you look at rats who uh, receive cocaine and press the lever until they die receiving cocaine, if you put them in that, they're sort of in solitary confinement. And so if you put them in an environment where they have other rats and rat toys and sweets, uh, they don't have press the lever forever. So uh, you know, the, the environment has an influence on rats too. And then if you think of the blue zones, so there's areas in the world where people live the longest, where centenarians live. And uh, that's like Okinawa, Japan, and Akira, Greece, and Loma Linda, California. And so part of this is genetics, of course. That's determining how long people live. There's also an environmental influence. So what is it about the environment that allows people to, to live so long? And so the central political challenge of our time is to think about how can we develop a, a wellness ecosystem? You know, what is that like, and how can we enhance our, our environment? And what about technology? So uh, there's web resources and Siri you can access things about how to thrive, smartphone apps, wearable sensors, there's something called the Aura Ring, which is a, a ring that has sensors on it that can measure sleep quality, deep sleep, and heart rate variability, and you can measure your, your stress recovery with a ring that you wear. 
And it's not very intrusive. It's not like having a watch on that would disrupt your sleep, you know, just a ring that you wear. And then people have digital signatures or phenotypes. So your text messages and your Facebook posts and your emails, all the writing that you can do can be monitored to see if there's evidence of any kind of concerns psychologically or you know, how are you thriving and what can be done to improve your functioning. Uh, and GPS movement analysis, voice analysis, there's something called emotional spectroscopy tools uh, where they look at people's faces and posture and gazes and they think that people's bathroom mirrors are gonna have sensors in them that will look at people's facial expression, their postures uh, when they look in the mirror in the bathroom. Uh, to determine if there's some evidence of psychological difficulties or how well people are thriving. Just back to mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the <laughs> so social media mentoring and coaching, web-based educational opportunities, even urban design to facilitate well-being. And ultimately, we'll have artificial intelligence assistants you know, that are going to provide us with evidence-based kind of information uh, with all the data available about what can help us thrive. And that's probably the, you know, the way of the future will be to have like a robot that uh, we communicate with and helps us out of the system. And then also experiences are important. So uh, when someone has an experience of tackling something that's tough or difficult uh, and they overcome it, it gives them a new psychological frame. So that's kind of what we're talking about with, uh, with uh, rescripting the life story. Also, positive experiences can knife off negative experiences earlier in life. So if you look at conduct disordered children, if they marry into a healthy family or they get a job where there's a healthy uh, place to work or they join the military, those positive experiences, those surrogate parenting experiences can knife off the past negative family experiences they had and change their whole life trajectory away from crime. <clears throat> Also, it's a, it, for positive experiences, it's good to take photos as a way of anchoring key moments. And so the last uh, story is putting wellness into practice. And so what I say is you want to eliminate lifestyle abuse. And uh, that's my term for kind of the terrible lifestyle that people live, particularly in America. And so we got to kind of eliminate lifestyle abuse and to get rid of that gap between what you know about how to live and how we actually live. And then, of course, you get good at what you practice, so we want to practice a healthy lifestyle. And then, uh, I'm interested in uh, how you design a healthy lifestyle. And typically with lifestyle, we think about diet and exercise. That's what everybody thinks of the lifestyle. But actually, I, I kind of think that we should have our lifestyle based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so the hierarchy of needs says if you progress through all these needs, you reach self-actualization. And so why not make our lifestyle based on those levels of needs? So you can address the physiologic needs through good nutrition and exercise and stress recovery and breathing exercises and rest. And the safety needs through driving safely and avoiding falls and not smoking or using dangerous drugs or excessive alcohol and having financial security. And belongingness and love needs can be built through group meals and dating and social networking. And esteem needs could be developed by spending time each day to work on talents. And cognitive, and cognitive needs can be developed by reading and schooling and educational video watching. And aesthetic needs can be developed by building beauty into your lifestyle. And so it's, it's a, uh, what I'm saying is basically, you know, why not work on a lifestyle that you self-actualize? All right, so... What is a translation of all of these different elements of positive psychology and positive psychiatry? We want to bridge the gap between psychiatry and wellness overall. So how do you define well-being? Well, I define it by four elements, looking well, feeling well, thinking well, and doing well. And so uh, positive psychology and positive psychiatry is not just fixing what's broken. It's, uh, it, it recognizes the importance of that it says maybe we should focus on flourishing and well-being as well. And, and like I said, with the, the neuroplasticity and the circuitry, you get good at what you practice. So you want to think about, you know, what am I practicing in my life and what am I getting good at? And so we want to empower people to develop a strong mind and become equipped to live with appropriate confidence and well-being. And so I'm suggesting that psychiatrists should be doctor coaches. 
and uh, not just uh, treat illnesses, but coach people into a life where they can thrive. It's hard to build for that, I guess. That's one, <laughs> one thing that we have to figure out in the world and what to be doing and what patients really want. We have to start to build. But so you want to listen, educate, empower, counsel, and inspire. And this is Usain Bolt. He says, sometimes you just have to put your foot down. So that's kind of my attitude. I'm, I'm really interested in positive psychology and positive psychiatry. And it's kind of a, a passion of mine. Uh, I think it's an important element to what psychiatrists should be doing. Thank you. It's not just geography, it's um, they all have that Hugo you talked about in the advantage. They all had different words for it, but it was the same thing. Yeah. There was a cohort of people that, that you cared about and cared about you that you got together with frequently to kind of guide your your journey for <clears throat> ameliorate stress or if you were ill to be taken care of that made a difference in in their longevity. The social warmth. Yeah. Protective feeling that you in a group backing you up and you back them up. I think part of what happens in this part of the world is we're so interested in rugged individualism, you know, kind of the independence and the tough. And so people are not necessarily more armed as they could be. It's just not part of our culture. Probably rapidly, those places are a little bit different though, also, and it's like 72, 76, and sunny every day. Well, not Denmark. Denmark, Denmark is freezing. <laughs> Denmark has a long, long winter. It's true. Yeah. Mm. yeah. One of the concerns I have, though, about this is to some extent you get into the area of values. You know, what makes a meaningful good life? And, and that's a value judgment to some extent. I mean, we have some scientific things in that. And the other thing, I was looking at the examples you gave people who overcame their mental illness. I don't know how to describe any of them as happy. But they were successful, and there's kind of a difference in being successful and being happy and, and what we accomplish in that. And it seems like it gets somewhat complicated in terms of how to decide what you're heading towards. Well, I'd go back to the what people's New Year's resolutions are about, so health, love, and work. So if, uh, or health, love, and finances. So if you meet those needs, I think people will, will be pretty satisfied. Do you agree? I think so. I think that I, I have patients that are wary about people's other people's values and somehow I think you have to be careful that if their values You want to impose your values on Yeah. That, you know, here's you know, maybe this is what we think is a great life, but for them it may be sacrifice and and other things that that may not fit into this thing. Yes. I just wanted to go back to the Abraham Lincoln issue because one of the stories from his biography, the biography of him, the Lincoln's depression. When he's in his twenties, he was a lawyer. A group of his friends locked him in a hotel room for two weeks because he was so suicidal. They were afraid he would he, he was going to kill himself. And for the rest of his life, he never walked around with a pocket knife or any sort of sharp object because he was he would tell you he was afraid of hurting himself. So you know when we're we've got all these patients that are. Actually, we're doing the same thing. You know, they may not all be future, you know, liberators, but some of them are starting in the same place. I guess my my point with those those individuals is that like, there's positive aspects of life that are possible for people who have mental illness. And, uh, if, and instead of just ameliorating symptoms, if we focus on what thriving is about and help people to find that, you know, function better in their lives and move towards thriving. I wonder how much quality of life they get. Awesome. Thank you. No. Oh,